Hello, my friend, and welcome to the 534th episode of the Sales Podcast. I'm Wes Schaefer at the Sales Whisperer, your host. Today, we're going to the dark side. And by the dark side, I mean Alabama football, Nick Saban. That's right. Well, I don't have Nick. But I have his performance coach, Brett McCabe. Dr. Brett McCabe. He's actually a friend of mine. He was a pitcher for LSU, and uh, if you know anything about baseball, LSU um, has a great uh, base, men's baseball program, um, great track and field, you know, up and down football, but um, Brett is a clinical psychologist. Um, our parents knew each other. Our, our moms were good friends, so I've known Brett oh, at least, since at least early 90s, um, and he's working at the University of Alabama. And um, he's had uh, an interesting background. I won't uh, steal the thunder, uh, but he's a performance coach. And, um, you know, as a subtitle of the blog post you know, I put today, you know, success leaves clues. Here's how to find them. So as we get into this, you know, I asked him about, you know, Nick Saban's secret to success. And um, he lays it out pretty straightforwardly. Um, but... Um, this applies directly to sales, to being an entrepreneur, to staying the course, to plotting goals, to adapting when you need to adapt, uh, knowing when to stay the course. Uh, you know, he works on how to get that last 1% out of people. Um, and if you've listened to this for any amount of time, you've heard me say sales is um, it, that that 1% can make all of the difference. You know, in, in sports, if you're just 1% better, if, if you're if you're a quarter of a percent better every day for four days, you know, you win a golf tournament, and which is the difference between half a million, $800,000, plus your name on the, on the trophy, all right? But second place still gets paid. But in sales, it's a zero-sum game. And what I mean by that is if you're 1% worse than the competition, they get all of the sale, and you get none. So this 1% is important. Uh, I think too often people get bogged down. We make these big goals, but we don't do the little things to bring them about. So I think you'll get some uh, some ideas from this. Uh, Dr. Mark Golston, he was a guest back on episode 466, so he's kind of in the same space. Uh, and we get into never splitting the difference. Uh, you may have heard the title of that. So he, he took a little umbrage with the author of that book and, uh, and his approach. But, um, you know, get some smart dudes on this on this here podcast. And uh, this is another smart dude. So you are in for a treat. Um, if you are looking to get that 1%, if you think I can help, hit me up. Go to the Contact Us page. Set a time to talk. It's free. Um, I've got some on-demand content. MakeEverySale.com. Avail yourself of that or join the um, Sell More of Everything program. All right. I will help you sell more, faster, higher margin with less stress and more fun. So let's get to it, shall we? Now, here comes Dr. Brett. Dr. Brett McCabe, my Cajun brother, living behind enemy lines in Alabama. <laughs> Welcome to the sales podcast. How the heck are you? You know, I'm good. It's good to be here. It's a long, long time. So <laughs> long time. We've known each other for way too long. Yeah. Since, I don't know, around 1990. Yeah. Probably even before that. Somewhere yeah. in there. Our, our moms were friends. Exactly. And, uh, but you know, I, I just joined the air force and just meandered my life away in sales, but you actually made something of yourself yeah, man, I don't know about writing that. books Coach in Alabama. Now I know the secret. Now I know why they're so good because you're you're oh, over yeah. there giving them some some Cajun words of wisdom. Now I'm kind of torn on if you should do that, <laughs> but we're going to get into that. Your recent book is "Break Free from Suckville: <laughs> How a Simple Mental Change Will Spark Your Performance." So we're going to dive into that. We're going to dive into your other books. But we were talking just before I hit record. You know what the heck it is you're doing. Your your background is what you got a, you got a phd in... so i'm a clinical psychologist okay. so i've got my phd in psychology i got it because when i was playing ball at lsu i was a baseball player there and and struggled with some injuries and struggled with just overall performance and 
kind of got turned on to the psychology of performance and really kind of turned on to the psychology of injury rehabilitation early on, mm. then took me down the path of studying to become a psychologist. And then I just did full circle after I did my residency. I did eight years in the corporate world doing research development, sales support from a medical side. And so, and then I opened up my own practice, but I think the evolution and the journey that I've been on is to kind of touch a little bit of every aspect of performance, whether it's on the the struggle side of people who are struggling with a lot of life's issues to the high performance side of trying to get the last 1% out of what they do. And being a psychologist allows me to see people in a different kind of way, I guess you could say is understand performance, understand human, you know, human behavior, human personality and desires and wants and things like that. I've asked people before and talking about like success versus failure and and why don't people take action? And, you know, why do they choke? Why do they, why do they fall back into old habits after some success? And I've, I still believe, I think people are more afraid of success than a failure. Cause I always say, you know, excuses can last a lifetime, right? Oh, I hurt my knee. Oh, I hurt my ankle. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. No wonder I, I can never be, you know, versus, you know, success takes daily effort. Yeah. A am I off track with that? No, or? you're, you're right on the money. I, I, my issue when I was playing ball at LSU was I was terrified of success because, you know, to your point, I had all the excuses. I did 85% of everything right. But it was that last 15% of trying to figure out, I want to call it, you know, being the dog in the fight or something like that, where it's just that extra little oomph that happens. And then what happens with success is, man, I got to do it again and again and again. I got to keep raising the bar every day. Failure, I had the excuse. Now, I will challenge this one aspect. See, you and me and everyone else, we're not afraid of failure. We're afraid of the moment we realize we failed. Because once we hit the ground, then it's like, let's get back up and get going. But once we realize in a game, the game is over. Like there's eight minutes to go and you're not going to win. There's that oh, realization. But success is never a conclusion. And that's the hard thing with success. Because now if I have success in a certain game, you're going to ask me to do it again. Or I slide back. If I'm you know, getting a job, and getting promoted, going from lead salesperson to sales manager, you know, well, how do I continue to push the bar of what I've been doing before? So we stay in our comfort zones. We stay in our own little boundaries where we're comfortable that we don't actually have to be stretched. We're good at, at bouncing back, but we're not good at pushing the bar. And that's why mediocrity has a million fans, but excellence has a million critics. And that's, what's critical. And we're the greatest critic of our own success. Why is that? I, you know, I've got a little bit of a new workout routine, right? I do jujitsu six days a week. I'm tired. I'm sore. I've, I haven't been going to the gym for, for years. I'm just I'm so beat up, right? And jujitsu is an hour and a half. I'm like, man, where do I get more time to go to the gym? But I'm starting to go before and just doing light stuff, 30 minutes, you know, do some squats, get some pull-ups in, just kind of build back. Yesterday, so yesterday was Sunday. And man, I, I was a day off, right? No, no jujitsu. And I'm like, I'm going to go to the gym. And I literally, I literally got in and out of the car, like open the door, close the door three times. And I'm like, go in the gym. Yeah. <laughs> you know? and I finally went. Yeah. But that's the thing, right? Is we can have, we can look at what it takes, right? And you know, we can take a look at what it takes for have a great organization, a great team, a great athlete but few people are willing to make the sacrifices of what it takes, which is getting out of our comfort zones, getting out into the unknown, getting out into the, the drama of life a little bit to know that you're going to go in a situation of going into a gym. That's going to take some effort, not really being able to think to the future to say, man, I'm going to feel so good. Damn good. When I leave here, because I slayed the dragon a little bit. It's so easy to take that immediate moment and to pull back. And we're just not comfortable in areas where we can get exposed. And we're so protected. We all live with a mask on. We all live with our protections high. We all live with a protection of our vulnerabilities. And I'm not sure why we do that. I don't, I'm not sure what the humanistic reason is for that. Everything that we have in our life has an ultimate reason. And the lack of vulnerability is tough because who says somewhere out there that we just simply can't be exposed, but yet when we're that raw, that willing to be in the unknown, that willing to be sac you know, sacrifice things, we're actually at our best. We're, we're all authentic. You probably had a great workout yesterday because you didn't want to be there. 
you know, you were, everything you were doing was a gain. Everything you were doing was better. Everything that you were doing was, was about an opportunity to enhance and not validate or prove. And I think that's ultimately when we get in a situation like that, we have to be willing to win that choice. James Clear talks about it in Atomic Habits, right? If you make the small choices, the big choices are easy. You know, the fact that you even got in the car and got there was a first great start because if you'd never gotten in the car, it would have been a lot easier to bail. Right. But a lot easier to say, ah, there's a football game on. I'll just crack open a beer. I'll sit here and watch the game versus I'm sitting in the freaking parking lot with my clothes on. Now, if I leave, <laughs> I've walked away as close as I could possibly be. Yeah. So once you got to that point, it was like, I'm all in. And so it's winning those little choices all along the way to slowly expand our, our aspect of where we're capable of going. Yeah. Yeah. I've got a saying, uh, you know, say to make any sale, you must make every sale. Yeah. You know, each of those. Yep. All along the way. You know, hey, can, psychologically, can I buy your drink. You know, hey, can I get your number? Hey, I mean, even getting married, right? I, yep. I, I took it was thirty or forty little sales before my wife yep. said yes. And <laughs> and what we call that in psychology is priming. All we're doing is priming the person to be ready to change. You know, we we oftentimes want the big knockout, right? We want the big dramatic shift. It wasn't there? And you know, it's funny you bring up sales. So when I was in the pharmaceutical industry, I developed a program working with my sales colleagues at our up, upper level about how to change human behavior with, through some psychological principles. It's really basic stuff, but most people overlook it. You know, you walk in and you see somebody, and this is, goes for coaching or leadership or anything. We walk in and we go, okay, this person should change. What happens if they don't want to change? What happens if what they like right now is better than what you can offer? Because the first suggestion of anything that people bring forward is resistance. People always resist. They either resist because it's too hard to make a change. They don't understand what you're asking them to do, or you're not taking into account what they have to give up in order to change. And people are okay in mediocrity. They're okay to stay where they are, even though it may suck. They're okay to stay where they are because it's better than the unknown of where they may go or what they may lose. So yeah, it's it, okay. It's the devil we know, huh? The devil we know is often better than the one we don't. And so what, what we did in pharma and what I do with my coaches is to say, look, let's assess their readiness to change. Let's understand what their barriers and their biases are. And then let's use those to start shifting them by creating a little bit of dissonance from where they are versus like, if you came to me and told me right now, Hey, you need to make a change. I'd go, eh, uh, it's okay. I don't have time mm -hmm. or it's too expensive. So the first answer we all do is, well, how about if I discount that price? Well, you just completely ignored what the real issue is. Mm -hmm. One is you never figured out what the real issue is. Never price, it's never price. It's always something else. And so coaches get an entire team in and they're like, Hey, we need you guys to do this, but they never once understood where they are. You know, they never understood where our clients are. They never under, people never understand where their client or customers coming from. They think they do, they say they do, but they really don't. And so what you're saying is every little cell along the way is getting to know, to get them ready for the strike point. Mm-hmm. How, how can we get people to open up without being manipulative and, and do it quickly? Like in a sales role, like uh, I can't take six months to close this, you know, $10,000 sale. I mean, maybe two calls. I mean, uh, you know, it's, it's certainly the bigger the deal, it might take more time, but still I, I can't yeah. dance forever. I, I mean, but you got to find out it, it is manipulation, but that's okay. Okay. There's nothing wrong with that. We, we've made, we just don't need to make it for a negative purpose. What we're trying to get people to do is to buy into why they need to change. Now, if I came to you and said, Wes, I need you to change because of this, you'd be like, dude, you just, I'm fine. Like, I don't need to change. You know how much it's going to take for me to have to do that? But the difference is if I can find out what's important to you by asking questions and being a genuine interest, interested listener and assessing about where you are, what's the most important things you face? What are the biggest challenges you have? And then creating some dissonance and the dissonance just the simple psychological distance we can create is to get me, I call it po uh, popcorn kerneling, which is essentially is I want that popcorn kernel stuck in the back of your teeth so that the next time you see it, you remember me. And now I've primed you. So if I'm coming in as a $10,000 sale, it's a big sale. If I walk in 15% of the people are going to say, let's do it because they're ready to go. And you probably don't have to do anything. You're just the next person who showed up. They are ready to buy. They're ready to go. They got to get this off the damn plate. But there's a lot of people, the bottom 15%, you ain't going to move them. It doesn't matter what you do. You got to identify them and move on. You got to have a plan for them for something else. But the other people is you got to get them ready to change. You got to get them prepared and ready to take action. 
And by doing that, you find out what's the most important thing to them. And if you can find out what that is without actually necessarily challenging it directly, but challenging it indirectly, now the next time they think about it or exposed to that pain point, it makes them look at what they think they had and what they really do have as separate. So for instance, if you said, you know, I'll put it this way. Let me just use a simple example. Most people I think would understand is if you go to the doctor and your doctor says, Hey, you need to lose weight. Like whatever, I don't need to do that. But if you go out and you put a suit on, you haven't worn in six months, it doesn't fit. Now all of a sudden it's like, shit, that, that doctor's right. And now I'm ready to make a change. You're not going to really remember, oh, the doctor was right. You're going to go, something's not right. So I've primed you to pay attention to it. And that's what I need you to, what people need to do is get them to be primed to pay attention to where, what that point is. So the next time you meet with them, now you've gotten a little bit of discomfort or pain in there without having to overtly or directly hit them over the head with a sledgehammer, which just doesn't work. Yeah. Coaches you know, do it all the time, yeah. all the time. Look, look, we're going to talk about that guy. All right. And, and, mm -hmm. you know, out of respect for your position, I, I won't call him what I really want to call him. All right. So, but you know, he did get his fame and fortune at LSU. So we're just, you yeah, know, he did well there. All right. But you know, people will make an appointment. I, I'm working with a guy right now that puts on these men's retreats and guys that they, they see the video it's emotional it's impactful they 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 fill out an application but not all of them answer it honestly yep right and but the, they're like we're not forcing them we're like hey we're creating some dissonance are some things lacking in your life yes yep. yes 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 fill it out but they still will withhold like dude why i i don't need this you, 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 I'm here for you, brother. Why are you holding back? Why, why do they, why do they go 85% of the way? Why do they go 99% of the way and still like hold back from the hand that's literally trying to feed them? Well, it's the same thing when people come to see me or we, when I used to do clinical work, it would take four or five sessions for somebody to open up and actually tell me the truth. And the number of times somebody comes in and says, Hey doc, listen, man, I, it's been a couple of weeks, but I'm sorry. I, I, I've been lying to you. And it's, yeah, I kind of understood that. Like, I, I, I know that what I'm seeing is only 85%. You could come in and tell me, I'm being completely honest with you, but there's something back there every time. I think some of it is we're so afraid to be judged, but really what it is, is if I really admit it, then I have to work towards improving it. And I don't want you in there. And I'm going to keep you at bay. And I'm going to keep you... Our, this generation today, and I'm not saying this as old guys, but this generation today, one of the things that we have to be aware of is people rarely give 100% of everything they have. They always hold back. And the biggest fear is that they're not going to be good enough. Inherently, I am not good enough. And, and I think it's because of the pressures, the standards, the anxieties that we all have, but that's part of it, right? Maybe I'm not as good characterologically maybe i'm not as good as a husband maybe i'm not as good as a man as i want people right, to but see here's the as. here's the crazy thing they're signing up to get counseling from but, you yeah right so they're correct. saying i'm it's, i'm broken but it's based on an issue 95 percent of the time it's based on an issue not the character oh. solve this issue and then i can move away from the pain point very rarely do people say now let's really dive into who i am that's the interesting thing, right? Because if somebody walked in and spilled it all on now, I'd be like, Whoa, what's the motivation of you to spill all your guts right out of the gate? Wow. Yeah. You so, know, that's, that's pretty out there on the table. That means they've already gone through a couple stages long before they ever get to me. You know, it's interesting you say that because a lot of things make sense. I, I've sold like very complex software. Uh, complex is probably the wrong word. Powerful software, mm -hmm. right? Once you dig in, the pieces make sense, but people, that's probably, that's what happens. They come to me with an issue mm -hmm. and then they complain, oh, that software is hard. Like it's not that hard, but they, I have to make them think, I, they, they come to me with sticky notes and, and whiteboards and journals and receipts with notes written on the back stuff in their wallet, All right? Here, automate it. I'm like, I can't do that. Right. I'm going to help you do that. I, I can't automate your entire business without you. Well, but it's, right. it's so, no different than what my kids I see at Bama, right? At Alabama, right? They come into the football program. They're all four to five stars and they're all phenomenal. 
They're all the best at where they've ever been with the highest ceilings that you see. We have every resource available to them. And why do some just refuse to take advantage of it? There, I was having a conversation one day with Derek Henry and not, not from a client standpoint, we were just sitting in a, the room with the strength coach and we were just talking about things, you know, and he had just come back after his first cup, second year in the league, Heisman trophy winner, tremendous hard worker, right? There's no question about that. And we were talking about using a, a biometric tool to measure kids sleep because this was during the time when athletics you know, athletes sleep was so important. And we were talking about that, how some of the guys on the team would, wouldn't wear it. They felt like they were being watched. They felt like they were being surveilled from, you know, oh, you can't go out at night, whatever. And they were doing crazy things like putting them on their dog or stuff like that, right? Just to mess with us. And Derek looks at me and the coach and goes, I don't get it. Like everything y'all gave me, I did. I'm like, well, dude, that's why you won the Heisman. Okay. But you didn't do it to win the Heisman. You didn't do it to become a first round draft pick or whatever he was you did it to be the best version of you you could be. And that's why you ended up becoming what you are. And that's why you continue to do that. But that's a very, very rare place to be where even as a freshman, Derek wanted to leave, right? He, he didn't, it was hard. Four or five stars ahead of him has to wait his turn. And all of a sudden here he comes. And it, he was fortunate enough to see the bigger picture Guys come in, and if I don't have immediate success, I'm not successful. If I don't have the early wins, I'm not successful. Versus, I'm building something. Everybody's on. The, everybody's running a different race, developmentally. Everybody's running a different way race psychologically and from a performance standpoint. So, as you're moving through this process, it's really hard to be out there in the way wide open, fully exposed, vulnerable for the world to see who you are, and still say I'm a work in progress. That's why people struggle. That's why people put up the blocks. And that's why I think companies and business leaders and coaches, a lot of times they get frustrated because all they want to do is to get into the messy part. They don't want to get into the, the two things you're giving me out front. They want to, they, I don't want to deal with your lost leaders, right? I want to deal with what's the basics and the foundations behind the scenes to see the long thing. But that's where we make mistakes oftentimes as practitioners is that we see the, we want to go deeper and all they want to do is take the first step. I had a patient, I can, I'll never forget. And I think I talk about it in Suckville, but I had a lady who came in to see me and she, I did the assessment and you know, I was in training at the time and, and she came in for depression. I was like, okay, you know, it's depression. But during the assessment, I kind of unearthed this idea, unearthed this underlying cause, which she had obsessive compulsive disorder, not like perfectionism. I'm talking like, don't step on a crack or you'll break your mother's back, washing your hands a hundred times a day, bathing in bleach type of stuff. Right. And I'm like, well, that's why you're depressed. And so I come back in and I give her the assessment and I'm like, this is what we're going to do. I'm going to treat this OCD. We're going to hit this and your depression will resolve. She never came back. And I went back and I was talking to my professor who, cause I was in training at the time. And I was like, man, I don't understand. He goes, you totally freaked her out. Why did she come to see you? She came to see you because she was depressed. She's been living with OCD for 30 years. She's okay with that. It's just recently it's gotten worse and you need to help her cope. If you wanted to attack the OCD, it was going to take months for you to get there. She just wanted you to help her out right now. It's not always about us as coaches, as leaders. Sometimes we got to meet them where they are and what they're willing to do to gain that trust and confidence so that they're willing to psychologically open up. So those people that are filling out that, those brochures or those questionnaires for you is meet them where they are and then the next time they come back, maybe they're more willing to open up and so on. You know what? Maybe, maybe I, I need uh, to get some certifications, man. Cause I always say that meet them where they are. I yep. always pick on men in my training. You know, I'm like, you're, you're the worst, right? We're the worst. Cause we want to solve things, mm -hmm. you know, and we hear the prospect go, well, I got this problem. Why don't we pounce on it? And we want to show them how smart we are, right? We're going to, you know, mommy and daddy didn't show me enough attention and whatever. I didn't win all stars. So I'm going to prove to the world how great I am by giving this 30 minute dissertation on this one little problem. You talk yourself out of the sales like, dude, you know, stop stroking your own ego at work, <laughs> you know, just make you know, the sale. <laughs> it, it's, it's funny, right? And, and it, it, when I worked in pharma, I supported, I supported our sales team as a medical, what we call liaison. So I'd go out, I didn't sell, but I sold every day. Okay. 
you know, I would provide the medical scientific re- rationale as to why medications worked in the disease state. And there are certain areas of the country that were highly primed based on some thought leaders that would be love the drug. And there are other places that they were fighting against purchasing and budgets and things like that. Completely unfair playing ground, okay, to measure great salespeople. It was truly market driven. But one of the things that I really noticed was the best, the best understood the issues and the barriers at hand for the providers they worked with. And they would recognize and try to solve those problems. Even though they had an ultimate issue of trying to sell more pharmaceutical product and get it prescribed more, right? The real issue was, let me understand what you're going through and help you solve that. Then you, be, then you get a champion on your side because they're walking the walk with you. And sometimes because selling is such a process, coaching and leading and change is such, I mean, we're talking about the same exact thing. Coaches have to sell every day. I tell, I say every coach that gets a division one job should hire a PR specialist as a full-time staff member to create every message that's being presented to the team and the media. You've been in locker rooms, you know what that's like. Okay. It's the same thing from a sales standpoint. Every point of contact must be driven towards an end goal. If it's not, it's chaos. We're just throwing stuff against the wall to see what sticks. You've got to have a long-term vision of where you want to take them in this one cycle. What's the end goal? If your end goal for somebody who's filling out the brochures just to get them on the grounds, solve that problem. Mm -hmm. Solve that problem. So what is this simple mental change? Is it different for everybody or is it one simple mental change? Well, it's all different, right? The, the biggest thing, it's all different based on who we are as a person, but the main foundation is the same. The biggest problem, what I call Suckville, is the space between where we believe our potential should be. All right, we're all married, romanticizing this idea about our potential. And our reality is falling just underneath it. And what, what happens is we anchor, we hook our dreams and our stars, and our self-worth based on our potential, but we never hit it. And so we're always falling short. And so what happens is the vast majority of people who come to see me are in this space where they're frustrated, that they're falling short, not reaching their potential and struggling. And it's what I call suckville because you think you suck. And what happens is you ignore the fact that your reality is improving daily. If you're investing in the little things every single day to get better, if you're investing in the things to improve your reality every single day, then what happens is you can get rid of the potential. If, if I sold, if I, if I won a championship this year, I'm going to move my potential for next year. I'm going to try to win it again. Okay. Versus listen, my simple mental trick is it no matter, no matter where I am, what I'm doing, I can always improve where my feet are. It could be through changing my process, changing my attitude, changing the people around me. We all have people around us that want to keep us suck, stuck in our own suck bills because they're in suckville too, and they don't want to see you succeed. Oh, it's too hard. It's better off the way it was. Shouldn't we go back to the old ways? All that other crap. Okay. The simple mental trick is, listen, I can change where I'm at and make it better. Don't worry about what it could be. Make what it is better. And if you do that, you're going to be okay. Now, somebody here is going to go, yeah, but people have better opportunities. Well, you have to understand that life's not fair. Not everybody who's a good person succeeds. Not everybody who's an asshole struggles. And that not everything is always equ- equitably paid out. Okay. There are certain people who have certain breaks in their life. Don't know why that is but they have to make the most of it because for every person who's taken advantage of it, there's 10 that have not and failed. And there's 10, there's always that one person who comes from very challenging circumstances and makes the most of it. Why the person sitting right next to him looks at it and goes, I'm getting screwed over. Somebody's willing to see it from a different perspective. And it, it, it's truly remarkable. And that's the simple trick is like where I am can always be improved by just doing the things around me to improve it versus shooting for the stars and falling short, shooting for the stars or anchoring to the stars and hooking to the stars and falling short. That's the simple mental trick. So, so aim, aim for the stars versus anchoring. Well, don't aim for the stars, have a vision of where you want to go, but don't measure your validation or your worth based on that. It doesn't matter because all you're going to do is change it. I mean, okay, let's take a look at Coach Saban. We want to win a national title this year. All right. 
show up on Tuesday after the national title. The first question is how are you looking for next year? It's immediate. And there's a, the, the funniest thing is when he won the national title at LSU, that was the question on the podium. And the, and he said, what do you mean? I just go back to work recruiting tomorrow. And everyone was like, Oh my God, what a, you know, you know, just a, a machine and how, I mean, he should enjoy it. No, what he was saying was tomorrow starts the next challenge. See, we're never content as human beings ever. We may get to a point where the effort is not worth the risk. So we go, it's okay. I can accept this. But for the most of us, you know, we want more followers. We want more people to buy our stuff. We want more people to have bigger sales. We want people to have more prosperity. We want more power. We want all those things are what we want more of. But if we anchor, if we hook, if we assign our validation and worth as a player, person, leader, whatever, based on those upper limits of performance, we're going to be unhappy. Mm-hmm. And what we have to do is change our mindset to say, look, I can take where I'm at and make the most of it. I think one of the best shows on TV is a show called Iron Chef because, or kind of the equivalent would be chopped right on the food network, but you give them a basket of stuff and say, make something. <laughs> I mean, they may have beef tongue, but they're going to figure it out. <laughs> and we don't always have all the ingredients. We may be missing something, but I can, I can be adaptive. I can be functional. I can create it. Right. Versus it's got to fit in this box. And because my anxiety says it has to, and it has to follow this way, or so I'm going to be frustrated. So our sports coach is just destined to be ground down and chewed up and spit out because they always <laughs> they can never rest they can never rest but the, the difference is you know you and i how, how do i measure who's the best psychologist out there how do i really measure who's the best salesperson out there? you right and me yeah exactly okay, next question yeah exactly <laughs> but man my professional athletes you know there's a top 100 golfers in the world ranking there's no question that Nick Saban is the best college coach to ever coach the game of football. You know, Skip Bertman, who I play for, is no doubt the best college baseball coach to ever coach the game. We can argue the Mount Rushmores, but we can look at a ranking and, and we have some objectifiable numbers. Mm-hmm. And that's why it chews them up and spits them out because eventually somebody new is going to be more innovative than them and is going to change the game and they got to reinvent themselves. Coach Saban is brilliant to continue to reinvent who he is. You know, he started off as a is a punishing defensive coach who had a good enough offense, but the defense was throttling. Now they're setting records for scoring. He's adapted and evolved, but what has never changed is his psychological investment to each player that he coaches. Every single player gets coached differently in that university setting. You know, we look at him yelling and screaming at certain players, you know, from being in the locker room and on the sidelines, there are certain players you can yell and scream to and they respond. And there's others, you better put your arm around them. The cameras don't catch that. They don't catch that. They catch him yelling and screaming at a player who's been in an environment where they've grown up like that. It's okay. You can yell and scream at me all day. Like, I know I'm not going to go home worried that you've, you're going to abandon me or leave me. Okay. But that's the thing is being able to innovate and to realize that, okay, kids today are different. Kids today come to college with a million followers on Instagram. They have a social status before they ever arrive. And, Most of them, some of them now are making more money than their assistant coaches in college. Mm -hmm. And how do we establish that line of demarcation to say, but here I am developing you. So you have to understand what's in it for them. What's their buy-in. It's okay. If a kid comes in and says, I want to play in the NFL. Okay. This is our track record. This is how you do it. Mm -hmm. Okay. But you have to buy into our system. Trust me and I'll get you to where I want to go. A young coach doesn't have that experience to say, trust me, there's been 47 first round draft picks in the last seven years, right? But he's got to get that, those coaches have to buy him and they have to meet the players where they are. Now, as a result, some people's answer is, well, kids today are soft or coaching can't be coached like we used to. Well, we also used to withhold water from players in the middle of the summer. You probably played a football in that time. Dude, yes, yeah. 84 to 88 in Houston. We yeah. got water. We got one water break yeah. in the middle of the practice. Like, what a, in the a, hell? A buddy of mine used to talk about when he played at Ole Miss. He played right around the time of Eli Manning, and he was very successful. But he said, you know, you'd pass out at practice, and they'd bring the pickup truck out, and the pickup truck didn't have a liner in it. And if you kind of woke up, they didn't take you to the hospital. But if you didn't wake up, that pickup truck hauled ass to the University Medical Center. I mean, the steaming hot metal. I mean, that's how we used to do things, right? So just because we used to do it doesn't mean it was the best. It didn't, (laughs) the junction boys of of Bear Bryant, yes, 
when we look at that and say they created tough men. But I'd also argue that many of the players we work with today are dealing with more stuff than we ever had to deal with. Yeah. And they're just as tough. They just do it differently. Yeah. They're more innovative. They're more, they're quicker to solve problems, but they're also more impatient than we've ever seen. And, and they have to be. They're competing against an ever-changing world that's moving so much faster than when you and I were there. One of my high school coaches was a junction boy. Oh, wow. And dude, he kicked our asses. <laughs> that was the only way he knew though, right? He was tough. He was good, but he was yeah. tough. And for our listeners, the Junction Boys were really Bear Bryant's first team at Texas A&M, and yep. he took them out in the middle of... Junction, Texas is still nowhere today. Yeah. And, and so it started was... with 90 and ended with 35. I mean... Yeah. Like it's what, like the 50s, right? Yeah, early 50s. It, it, it's no different than how they weed out the Navy SEAL training. Yeah. Okay. You're Because what they want at the end is the collective group to look across each other and go... It's not that I'm better than you. It's just, I've been through what you've been through. Yeah. That's all that was. And we had those big, you know, the big, whatever, 36 quart or whatever ice chest. Yeah. Right. We had one of those filled with ice <laughs> and they had all these hoses. And I tell my kids this and they freak, even my son, who played football. He's like, what? You filled your helmet up with that ice and you plugged the hole at the top for the vent. <laughs> Figured it out. And you and you filled that thing up and you drank it right from the helmet. And they, they still can't believe it. And I was like, that was the best water in the history of the world. Yeah. And now <laughs> what do we have? We have tractor trailers sitting out there for them to go in and get their body temperature down. But that's a safety issue. Yeah. I mean, oh, we don't I need know. to see another kid die. And, and know, so people dude. go, oh, that's soft. That's not soft. It just knows that where we can push them. That was reckless what we did. But we didn't know any different. Yeah, we didn't, you know, none of us grew they up wearing They had to belts. know. Because like, man, you know, you get a break and you go stand behind everybody and make friends with the trainer. Because the trainer always had a little bit of water. One of those old school ones with that right. little straw bent down, you know, he, he'd hit you, you know, gets just like, give me something, man, I'm dying. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, and that it, it's, but that's the thing, right? Is great people are totally innovative. You know, it, it's not about the CRM. It's not about the the PowerPoint slide deck. I mean, we've seen things come and go since PowerPoint was brought up that have gone away. I mean, it still comes down to how good is your information and how many people would get behind you and believe in what you're teaching. Mm -hmm. And as long as you're staying ahead of it, you'll get people to empower because you're going to meet the needs of your customers. You're going to meet the need of the people who follow you and you're going to make them both raving fans. Mm -hmm. It ultimately comes down to selling and PR. And yeah, that's what it comes down to of, of can you meet people where they are? You know, I love the point you make about saving, you know, because, yeah, back in the day, I mean, the Southeastern Conference was power eye, grind them down, win it in the fourth quarter, you know, seven to three, 10 to seven, you know, and now it's 50, you know, 50 points is kind of the average. Yep. And so, how what's his secret to innovating because i mean because in a way you have to admit you know to innovate admits what was working before isn't working now like so obviously he doesn't take it personally right he's like okay we're not defense anymore we gotta score some points why is he better at that than others i think he's willing to admit that his way is not necessarily the best way forever so great story about him and how he turned to psychology. He's one of the earliest coaches in football that really embraced the psychological side is he had a player at Michigan state who was a very talented player who was going to play in the NFL and he was struggling with him at practice. And so he, he made an appointment for the kid to go see the, the team psychiatrist. And after the appointment, he called the doctor and the doc said, he said, doc, what do we need to do to change this kid? He goes, it's not him. It's you. You're not going to change this kid. And Coach Saban said, literally said at that moment, all right, what do I need to do? What time can I come see you? In other words, teach me, teach me about this. That guy is still with him today. His name is Dr. Rosen. He's the secret behind everything. He's the right-hand man to Coach Saban. And Dr. Rosen is in his high 80s. He's, he's debriefed people coming back from concentration camps and prisoners of war. He's a genius psychiatrist and understanding of human psychology. And it's still part of coach Saban's success. And the reason is, is he's always learning to get ahead and he wants, you know, everyone says he's the best recruiter because he loves it. He doesn't love recruiting. He said on the record many times he, does, he doesn't like it, but he knows everyone else hates it. And that's his advantage. 
he's willing to do the things and admit that he doesn't have all the answers. He's, if you look at the people who come through that program year in, year out, he brings in the top experts every year to speak to the team. And he sits on the front row and he takes notes. The first time I spoke to the team, I had met with him for 30 minutes prior and his coach was my AD. My coach was his AD at LSU. We had a long conversation about that. We go down. I thought he would bail on me for front row, taking notes, filled up a notebook in the 45 minute talk that models to the kids. Listen, this is important. You know, if you tell people to do it, but you're not willing to be the one that does it, he, he doesn't bark at people to clean the garbage cans. If, if it was true, he'd probably be the one to clean the garbage cans. Like it's not, he's not going to ask people to do things that he doesn't believe. And that's, what's important. Yes. There's a hierarchy there, but he is hands-on with his players. He is coaching them in practice every single day. He coaches the DBs on the defensive side as the head coach. He's out on the field. He's not sitting in the bird's nest, watching everything from a remove. He is a fully ingrained and immersed CEO. Mm -hmm. And he has a lot of people around him, a lot of voices. Right now we have two former NFL head coaches that were head coaches in the NFL this time last year that are on staff, but he is still the boss. Now he gets their information. He studies and learns. He brought in Lane Kiffin, who everybody thought, oh, that's a match made in misery. It turned out to be a brilliant match because two very smart people, two very willing to do whatever it takes to learn. And they were a little like oil and water on the surface, but they worked well together because coach said, you're an expert. We need to evolve, figure it out. And, you know, Lane was willing to put his ego aside and say, I'm willing to come here and be, be coached. And he did. And I think those are the things we need to look at is we don't have all the answers just because I've had success up till now. That's in the past. Somebody's going to do it better than me. Somebody's going to be more effective than me. Listen, we used to say there will never be a, a company that would knock down Walmart. Well, hello, Amazon. All right. People are saying, well, Apple's the biggest company, you know, somebody will beat them. It's, it's just, it's a matter of time. Somebody more innovative is going to come. Somebody's going to think outside the box and continually improve what they do. It may not be me. It may not be you, but it's going to be somebody. And we have to be willing to always go back. You know, when you finish the day, when you finish our job, when you finish our life, we're going to look back at our bookshelf and our bookshelf is going to be filled with books that we've read and experiences that we've created. And that is going to be the wisdom of what we live our life by. And if we don't have a full bookshelf, then we're way too, my, you know, too focused, too narrow focus. We've got to be expansive. Our bookshelf should have, you know, information there on the psychology of humans. It should be on there about organizational improvement. It should be about there about faith and spirituality, whatever your thing is. It should be back in there and fix. It should have a variety of different things, not things that we just, we just only believe in. Mm -hmm. When is the leader at risk of of losing control or losing that power you know let's say lane kiffin is you know better at offense or somebody else is better at defense or this other guy is you know the greatest quarterback coach ever you know somebody might actually not bring that guy in because they might feel threatened like oh I, this guy is too bright of a light he's gonna yeah outshine me you know it but the best people you've ever been around that have been leaders oftentimes will say, God, I think I'm fooling everybody. Like my team is so much better than me. And so there's a, there's an anxiety as well as a comfort. And it's a weird conflict. The anxiety is, Oh my God, they're going to expose me for not being as good as I think I am. The other side to that though, is, you know what? I'm giving them the platform to be their greatness. I'm going to take away some of their risks. I'm going to take away some of their stressors. I'm going to clear it up enough to allow them to go. And I'll take care of the stuff to, and let's see where they can go. I'm going to give them the guidelines. I'm going to keep them within the realm, but I'm not going to limit them. When we have our own insecurities, we go to that person and say, you can't do that. And why? Or, or I need the credit. Listen, you don't need the credit. If you're in a job that is, totally defined by who gets the credit you're doing it wrong credit will always find you if you're not looking for it do your job do it better than everybody else and people will continue to hire you you know it's it's show me why you're different you know i can we can sit there and hire salespeople because I've, I've done this and we can have 10 brag books out there 
they're all going to look great, but I'm going to be the one that knows how to connect to build a team and in a, in a, build a cohesion and alliance around them. And that's what you look at. And so is there going to be a coach that's going to surpass coach Saban? Sure. At some point they may not eclipse his record that whatever, I mean, it's just times change, but there'll be the next great. There's got to be, you know, he thought there'd never be another Michael and here's LeBron. Mm -hmm. And I'm not willing to say that LeBron is better than Michael. I'm a Michael Jordan guy, but you got to look at LeBron and go, dude's freaking ridiculous. He's better than Kobe. Okay. You know, and I'm not, yeah, but you know, we, we have gray in our beard. So, I mean, we're, we're going to skew towards Michael. Sure. But guess what? There's going to be another guy that's going to come after <laughs> LeBron. You know what I mean? They are. Yep. And who would have thought, I mean, here's Tom Brady, right? Not the most talented. Definitely has his own way of doing it. Is unbelievably powerful. There'll be another guy. Mm -hmm. Now, will they reach six or seven super? It, there's a lot of out of your control for that. But there's going to be the next great one. And what's going to happen to everybody who's great is you're going to have to manage those distractions and stressors and all the other stuff to be able to continue to have success. So that you're not a two or three year wonder. Yeah. Longevity is what you're talking about. Yeah. I love you mentioned earlier about saving, connecting, you know, with the players as they require. Cause I'm always telling salespeople, you know, we have to adjust how we sell to match how the prospect buys. Yeah. You know, you got your 87 page manual and hundred slide deck. Some people need to see all of that. Some just need to look at the thing, touch it and they'll buy it. You know, don't, don't talk your way out of a sale. You know, but so many times guys are so rigid, you know, oh, this is my process and uh, you got to hear all of this. <laughs> like, yeah. Why do we well, sabotage? I mean, in, in science, when I, when I was in the medical side, I used to say there's three levels of scientific communication. The first one was presenting the information. Here's my information. I'm going to present it to you and you're going to listen. The second one is answering questions. Okay. I can answer the questions per the book, but the last one is conversational science which is I can have a full dialogue with you about what you need and answer it without you feeling like you're being presented to, you know, it, we're going to go to the most, you know, thing that we all know, buying a car, you walk out on there and you ask the person and they give you the technical details of the car. I can look that up online. I don't need you to tell me that. Tell me why I'm going to love this truck or this car. Tell me why this is special to me. And if you can weave it into that conversation, now you're getting me to start believing and seeing myself in that position. That's the conversational aspect of it. So when you're talking about selling, right? If I'm, if my anxiety is like, I've got to follow this according to the plan. Somebody says, what's the gas mileage? And you say, it's this, you never ask how far I drive every day. You know, I may work out of my house and drive literally 500 miles a month. Gas mileage was just a question I was asking. You didn't get to why it was important to me. You know, and those, that's a very simplistic answer, but you got to understand why use it for football. I want to play in the NFL. Why? Well, it's because of what I've always wanted to do. Why? I don't understand. Like what? Well, I want to support my mom and family. Okay. Now I've got a different answer. Mm -hmm. I hate to tell our listeners on this, the probably about 40 to 50% of those professional athletes I work with, they don't love what they do. Mm -hmm. They do it because they can't make any other money anywhere else like that. Right. And they gut it out and they, and so they have to connect to their why of what they do. Mm -hmm. And it's okay to say, you know what, this is true. It's extremely exposing. It's extremely difficult. Yeah, I know it's not working in the minds or stuff like we could talk about, but ego is ego. And anytime you're exposed like that, it's, it's stressful and it's exhausting and it's, it'll wear you out. And so being willing to, to go out there into that darkness and put ourselves out there for something that's truly important to us. If we can tap into that as a coach, as a leader, now we're really singing the, we're working in concert with them. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Oh. Well, I am linking to your website and it's Brett with an H, right? That is Brett correct. McCabe, two C's, yep. brettmccabe.com slash books. So you've got, uh, you've got an elite journal, you've got the game plan, you've got the mindset manifesto and now break free from Suckville. That's it. Very yeah. Nice. Uh, journaling. I will say this. I think every great person should journal every day. 
if you don't keep your notes down, you don't plan your days, then all you're doing is allowing your emotion of today to define your, your overall snapshot of how you feel, right? You don't ever see trends. It's hard to remember four weeks ago what you had for lunch. So you don't know if you you know continue to have bad lunches or just two bad days in a row. The mind side manifesto was all about my theories and ideas about performance, but suck feels really about managing the frustrations. The game plan arose out of the mind side manifesto is a little bit more of a workbook, usually more for younger kids to help them understand how to build self-image. But really Suckville is probably the book to help us manage the disconnect, the dissonance that we feel in today about us always falling short. We never measure up to what we think we should be. Mm -hmm. Let's just be honest. Somebody's always going to, if you've ever looked for a house and you're like, I can afford any house I want. There's always a house that's out of your price range that you really wanted. Mm Mm-hmm. It's, it's guaranteed. There's always a car that's out of your price range that you really want it. There's always somebody, if you, if you fly only first class, there's somebody who flies private, somebody who flies private. There's somebody who owns a jet. There's always somebody who's going to up you. Yep. For everybody at Alabama, there's somebody at LSU. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. But you know, it's true, right? It's true. Yep. I mean, it's, it's everybody has their heyday. Everybody has their time and glory. And then we got to reinvent ourselves mm-hmm. probably about every seven years. We have to reinvent ourselves a little bit mm-hmm. and we learn and we grow. And it's important that we do that in everything that we do. And if we're not taking a regular account this time of year, particularly in the fall, then when the spring hits and the energy gets high again, we'll be running past it. Well, you said, you know, Alabama brings in the best. So I'm, I'm waiting for my invitation to come speak. So you probably Absolutely. email me like, right. I probably already email my inbox, huh? Exactly. Nice. Exactly. You should. You should. <laughs> you should. I mean, listen, and and you know, I know people will look at it and say, oh, whatever. Study the greats. Success leaves, leaves clues in everything we do. Yep. And just few of us are willing to do it. And that's okay. Yep. We just have to be willing to accept the fact that it is hard. Yep. And there are sacrifices we have to make. And if we're willing to make those sacrifices to get to the success that we need to. We'll get there. Yep. Amen. All righty. Brett McCabe, the man, the myth, the legend. Thanks for coming to the show, man. It's been great. Good to see you again. Thank you. you. This is so hard. I just interviewed a couple days ago a guy named Tim Van Milligan. He's going to be on episode 542. But we get into selling and and um, connecting with values uh, we get into person selling by personality type, and he reached out to me because he poked some, I don't know, poked the arguments a little bit, if you will, poked some holes in Dan Hill's interview, 531. And now you see Dr. Brett here talking about priming the person to be ready for change, how people always resist at first, uh, how to get them to buy into what they need to change. So... You know, I'm. I try not to be too far ahead on these interviews. Right now, I'm. I'm five to six weeks out. Uh, even compressing the time frames down to four days, five days between each episode. So I want to give you enough time to listen to them. But um, man, there's just some good stuff out there. But this stuff's important, right? Uh, creating dissonance. Uh, he calls it popcorn kerneling, getting stuck in the back of your teeth so you remember me. Um, people take a while to open up. So, you know, what are you doing to shorten time frames? Because time kills deals. Um, and you've probably heard me say this as well. If I talk more than five minutes, you'll hear me say something that appears contradictory. Because on the one hand, time kills deals. And what I mean by that is, if you're too slow to respond to someone, you'll lose that deal. But conversely, if it's a bigger deal, if you rush to try to close it, you'll kill that deal. I will literally slow play larger deals. I don't want them to think I'm hungry or desperate. And I want to make sure all of the ideas, all of the gotchas are out in the open. So I know how to price it and I know whether if I even want the deal. Okay, so but how do you get people to open up quickly So there's time to actually close that deal. Now, flip this onto yourself. Where are you closed off? What are you not open to? 
What trauma are you holding on to? It's your crutch. It's your excuse for not hitting bigger goals, for not doing more. It helps you justify why you sleep in, why you drink too much, why you don't exercise. It helps you justify why you don't launch a new program or kill an old program that isn't working. It's your excuse for not investing in yourself by hiring a coach, someone like me, someone like Dr. Brett. What are you holding on to? What are you closed off to? Okay. So you need to go back and listen to this, right? There's always something back there. We're afraid of opening up. We know if we open up, we'll have to work on fixing it. I've always said one good excuse can last you a lifetime. But success takes daily effort. So why do you think you're not good enough? We think we're coming for help for an issue instead of our character. Ouch. Ouch. You need to see the big picture. You're running your own race. It's tough to admit I'm a work in progress. So if you can figure out yourself, it'll be easy to figure out your prospects. Your prospects are drawn to you when you're confident. Zig Ziglar always said selling is a transference of a feeling, and that feeling is confidence. You could have the best solution out there, but if you're not confident, you won't be able to give the thing away. So work on yourself first. That's what I offer. I'm actually putting together a, an intense one-day package. I'll probably do these. I'll open them up one or two a month. It's a full day, one-on-one. Uh, if you're a business, you know you can bring in some of your key staff, but the idea is to just bang out a lot of deep, hard work fast. So stay tuned for that. I'll be announcing that in the next couple of episodes. The landing page is built, uh, updating the uh, free giveaway and the drip sequence. But uh, So stay tuned. That's coming up. But um, if you want to talk about it, hit me up, the Contact Us page. I can go over the details with you if you're interested, if you think you have a need, if you think that can benefit you. Uh, but you can make big changes fast. Uh, if you're open to it, if you're ready for that change, if you're if you're tired of mediocrity, if you're tired of second place, let me know. All right. And as always, you know all the, the sites, makeeverysale.com, sellmoreofeverything.com. If you're looking for technology, you know, I've been in that space a long time. Bestcrmforme.com. Go take the quiz, free quiz, and it'll spit out some recommendations for you. All right. It's good for you. Thanks for listening. Go sell something.